now you are the host, sir. Right. Thank you. You can share your screen, sir. Yeah, yeah, I'm just trying to do that. Yes, thank you. Are you all able to see that now? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes. Um, okay. Good afternoon. Good evening, everybody. Thank you very much, Dr. Kavita, Dr. Ishwar, every one of you for giving me this great opportunity. Um, as uh, Kavita started this beautiful program with Guru Vandana, uh, we all owe ourselves to that great Guru. So if you could uh, come please a bit closer to the microphone. Oh, you're not able to hear me, sorry. Uh, I see. Okay. I'll just reduce it for a second and see what's wrong with this. Can you hear me now, Ishwar? Still bad. I can use uh, I can use speaker if you can't hear me. No, better, sir. Better, better if you go back. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so let's, without uh, wasting much time, we'll start with the, the imaging in dementia. The idea of uh, dementic illnesses as a reason for imaging has been there for a very long time. And um, that's, by the way, that's the institute I work at St. Vincent's Hospital. On the right side corner, you are able to see this long building that it's the research building I, uh, I work in. Um, so these are uh, basically a group of heterogeneous disorders with uh, progressive decline in the higher functions. The point that is, uh, we, we call it as cognitive impairment. We are not looking at dementia. Dementia, you don't need to image. There is obvious clinical spectrum which can make you understand that this is the most likely reason. But it is a minor cognitive impairment that is, uh, that is the most challenging thing for us. And in the minor cognitive impairment and in the dementic illnesses, the common thing is memory, right? And, but there are several things in the memory. In that memory, what happens in minor cognitive impairment is the person knows that he has forgotten, but he doesn't know what he has forgotten. This kind of frustrates him and it is very difficult to get around with. And that is the reason why they present themselves to a neurophysician. So with this kind of a minor cognitive neuro impairment, you have very clear evidence now that nearly 70% of these minor neurocognitive impairments turn out to be Alzheimer's disease. Whilst I don't know what is the real incidence of uh, Alzheimer's disease in uh, India, I don't think really we have any good statistical data really available. But it is one of the leading causes of morbidity mortality in most of these Western countries. And once you have high morbidity, there is naturally a lot more expenses involved in it. So we'll try to, Alzheimer's disease really is not an imaging, MR imaging pathway to identify. Now, uh, nuclear medicine, the pets and the ligands have really come in a big way to identify it. We still do MRI and we will see what are the likely things that MR can do to identify it. But this is the, um, premise that which I'm working on, most of the Alzheimer's disease, I don't think if I have a Alzheimer's disease patient, I would prefer the patient to get a PET rather than an MRI. That's what it is. So the cognitive impairment, any cognitive impairment by, by pathological basis is cortical yeah. or subcortical. 
but white matter is not really the important thing to identify uh, as a cause of cognitive impairment. But we know that there can be mixed diseases where the white matter can get involved. This is a broad classification. It's my own classification. So in the cortical clauses, we'll try to see most important is Alzheimer's disease, but we, if we have time, we'll talk about frontotemporal dementia. In the subcortical category, we have, we have to have some classification. That's why I have got with this classification. So in the subcortical clauses, we have obviously Parkinson's disease, NPH, AIDS, chronic multiple sclerosis, Huntington's disease, and so on. In the mixed variety, we have again, very interesting disorder called AIDS dementia complex, where previously AIDS was considered as subcortical. Now we know that it is cortical. When I say AIDS, it's not frank, full-blown AIDS, but HIV disease. The related treatment related, radiation treatment related, white matter and cortical changes is a big part of our discussion. We will talk about it if we have time. And other things like yoga, Christian disease is another area. So what are the basic three steps that happen in these dementic illnesses? We have loss of structural integrity. So you can use structural imaging to identify it. You can also look at the connectivity abnormality. Once the structure is gone, the connections between the structure to structure is lost. This connection can be anatomical or it could be functional, that means electrical. Abnormal metabolism, that is, you have ligands in PET imaging, but you have also MRS and newer imaging with nanoparticles. And blood flow naturally get affected. But again, the, the, the underlying important part is that you're not really looking at the point when the disease is actually starting. Perhaps MRS and functional MRI are the two techniques which can identify the abnormality at a cellular level. The rest of them are all really macroscopic, so PET is probably preferred. When we're talking about microscopic imaging to identify the structural integrity, you can use MTC that is magnetization, transfer contrast, diffusion of different types, and relaxometry. So in relaxometry, this is basically because I'm sure there are radiology registrars. This is not for the consultants. You actually use multi, multiple TEs to get the same region in different relaxation characteristics. You put an ROI, propagate across the entire hippocampus, and make a, a, a sum of these relaxations, and then the computer spits out the answer. That is, this is the TE, this is the relaxation, and this relaxation is abnormal or normal. This need not be hippocampal, this can be anywhere, but that's a very important technique to identify the microscopic structural abnormalities. Now, macroscopic abnormalities are volumetry. Volumetry is a very simple technique. As I, I think last time when we were talking about it, we did discuss if about a $50 in Australian dollar, you would get a, a complete volumetric imaging data with a, with a push of a button. So I'm sure in India also, we have this available techniques where you pay about 1500 rupees or 2000 rupees to get this data. It's extremely useful because that will tell you where the actual volume loss is. That's a microscopic type of volume loss. Neuroquant is one, in this one type of uh, such thing that you can use, but you can use voxel-based morphometry. This is much more finer type of morphometric measurement where you actually get the voxel-wise volume loss, which is extremely sensitive. Uh, if who is interested, whoever is interested, if they can write to me an email, I can show, I can send them the details how to process this. It's a very simple technique. There is a statistical parametric mapping, which is a software which you can get it. And on that, it sits this particular program and you can measure the voxel based morphometry. Neuroquant is a larger type of uh, morphometry where you pay money, you get all the details, where you get the hippocampal volumes 
and you can see the difference in the hippocampal volumes. And you also have various uh, regions of the brain which are normative data compared. This is, of course, Caucasian normative data, but generally speaking, fits well with most of the Indian subjects also because I tried both uh, my own methods of FSL uh, using first uh, FIRST uh, software and compared it with Neurocont on Indian subjects and it, it also worked well. Voxel-based morphometry is extraordinarily sensitive to pick up very subtle areas of voluminous. So that is something which uh, it's here. This is, a, this is a patient with neurocognitive impairment. You can see that there are areas, multiple areas which are lost and in addition to hippocampus. Magnetization transfer contrast is basically a technique where integrity of the white matter can be assessed. It has been there for ages and there is nothing fascinating about it. Now there are better techniques to identify this. But, but that's one technique. We can use it to identify that there is white matter integrity loss. Cortical integrity magnetization transfer is not the ideal technique. Now, blood flow. As I said, when you have structural abnormality, you have compromised the blood flow. This compromised blood flow can be picked up using, last time we discussed dynamic susceptibility contrast or dynamic, dynamic contrast enhanced imaging, that is T1 and T2 perfusion techniques. Or you can also label the RBC with magnetization pulse and look at the blood flow in different distant part of the brain. This is a very interesting technique. Now, as you can see here, there is an area of excitation of the RBC by the magnetization pulse and you measure it after X amount of time. So it has got some pitfalls. You have to be aware of them, uh, but it is both quantitative and qualitative, extraordinarily useful. Tell is pretty well with the FDG PET. While step, you know, as you know, FDG is actually metabolism, but for metabolism to happen, the blood flow has to go there. So that blood flow, you can actually compare it with the ASL. So as you can see here, there is a precuneous involvement, there is a precuneous involvement. I mean, this is an ischemia, but I'm just trying to show you the concordance of ASL FDG in different types of disease patterns. So exactly FDG where it is abnormal in Alzheimer's, you can use the ASL and demonstrate similarly. Is it as sensitive? We don't know. Maybe according to some studies, which are, which are, Meta-analysis studies, ASL seems to stand pretty well with FTG. So same thing, you can actually see the basic raw data where you can see the signal intensities and you can color code them. This color coding can be done with a particular vessel. For example, left ICA, you can color code with one particular color, right ICA, vertebral, which will give you some extra benefits like precuneous involvement medial temporal lobe involvement. We know that this is PCA supply. That kind of an advantage is there. Now, disruption of the connectivity, we can also pick it up by, we can use it by using diffusion imaging. In diffusion imaging, we all know diffusion tensor is the commonest model that we use, but there are advances. These advances are, for example, you can see here, there is what is called diffusion kurtosis. But the kurtosis is basically a, a diffusion tensor is a Gaussian type of diffusion model, whereas the diffusion kurtosis is a non-Gaussian type of diffusion model. Once it's non-Gaussian, it has got much more sensitivity. Um, basically, that is the essential part in the diffusion kurtosis. But Nadi is one of the most fascinating things that's come up now. Most of the white matter and cortical, previously diffusion was not a cortical a property. You could not get the ideal property of cortical diffusion because white matter is much less, the water proton movement is much less. But not in neuritic orientation and dispersion and density imaging is an extraordinarily sensitive technique to both pick up both white matter as well as gray matter. This is the example of Nodi in uh, different uh, types of uh, neurocognitive impairment and uh, 
basically you won't get much like an anatomical imaging you can't really read them but i just want to give you an understanding that there is a technique called nadi and this is an extremely powerful technique now let's look at the last part of it a mass spectroscopy this we have discussed last time from 0 to 4 left right to left and universal standard of methyl tetramethylsilane from where the four metabolites sodium uh, sorry na creatine choline myelin acetal but you have another two important metabolites in cognitive impairment uh, spectrum for example uh, in patients with cognitive impairment you have what is called uh, a excitotoxic injury so these patients have abnormal gaba uh, gamma gamma amino butyric acid or you can have a very abnormal glutamate glutamines. So, so those are the things that you can appreciate that. And you also can look at the functional MRI. In the functional MRI, you are looking at the blood oxygen dependent signal change. So when you actually, when you move your fingers, the cortex gets activated. So increased blood flow into the cortical area. Once increased blood flow, that blood flow is, has got oxyhemoglobin, that oxyhemoglobin gives you a signal. That's what you're looking at. Of course, it gets deoxidized because of the increased activity there. So it's a difference between the intensity of the oxy and deoxyhemoglobin gives you that, that, uh, that, uh, that uh, basis of functional MRI. Now, we know that uh, these are the task and task-based paradigms but now there are a fascinating area called resting state networks. If you look on Google and type in the maximum number of papers that come in the modern radiological literature is resting state function MRI. This is the most robust technique. And I think whoever is interested in good research should understand this. And there is a beautiful program called CON, C O W N, all in capital. It's a free software. You can download it. You don't have to have any kind of uh, uh, basic uh, um, advanced software like SPM FSL. It runs on its own and it's extremely e e easy to use. So please do use it and it helps you. So the most important network in, in, a, in, a, in a normal individual at rest is the default mode network. We all know when we sit idly, our brain is extremely widespread. It thinks about one thing, it thinks about second thing, and it keeps jumping. Like a bird which flies from one tree to other tree, it doesn't ever sit. That's how the mind is. So if you do meditation and you look at the default mode networks, they all become very, very quiet. This is a technique which I did it on my own. I have, I have done the meditation, I got MRI done, and I repeated it six times. Every time I do meditation and I measure the deep wall mode networks, their intensity or their strength reduces. So this is a very powerful technique. There are papers, uh, enough papers to show that the deep wall mode, it's not exclusively I have done it. There are several people also have done it. And they show that the deep wall mode networks immediately get very, very quieter once you start using meditation. So, Indian yoga has got a very strong evidence, scientific evidence now. Now let's go and look at some diseases. Alzheimer's disease, as I already said, it is not a imaging for MRI or CT. Only advanced MRI where you want to exclude other things, Alzheimer's MRI can be done, but it's a pattern, pattern, pattern only. Basic pathology, we know it's a beta amyloid, which is an extracellular one, neurofibrillary triangles, which are intracellular one. And we know that the neurofibrillary triangles are the ones which actually drive the maximum pathology and the reactive gliosis. Then what is the role of uh, MRI? If I don't have PET scan, not available, then what I would look for? I look for volume loss in the entire brain, except two areas. One is occipital cortex, that is around the visual area. And the second is primary sensory motor cortex. These two areas are not involved in Alzheimer's disease. Rest of all the brain is involved. 
So it's important that we should be aware that the Alzheimer's disease is not exclusive to temporal lobes. While it starts at the temporal lobes, it's a diffuse brain disease. There are several forms. This is not greatly uh, new observations, new points. We have presindolin, which is a which is a congenital form, which where the Alzheimer's starts early on in 40s and 45s, whilst an adult onset is late onset. But that's not uh, we. What is interesting for us is to look at. Uh, disease modifying agents. This is where MR plays a very strong role. So we know that uh, these disease modifying agents have come, monoclonal antibodies. I do not know whether there's, I'm sure there must be a number of centers which are using in uh, India, but I don't know whether Hyderabad, any, any particular center is using it. It's a very fascinating area one can really look at. So, but in case if you have to do MRI, what is the better way of looking at it in, if you don't have the volumetry, you don't have the advanced imaging techniques? What is it that you want to look for? It is the parahippocampal fissure. Look for the parahippocampal fissure. That's the parahippocampal fissure. That's the parahippocampal fissure. That's the parahippocampal fissure. That's the para. This fissure gets widened. If that is widened, it's nearly 70% of the times that hippocampus is falling past. So I would suggest look for parahippocampal fissure because if you look for the entire hippocampal volumes, you have to kind of get a ratio of the total brain volume to the hippocampal volume. But if you have the parahippocampal fissure, there is a predictive accuracy of 91%. So why would you not do it? So you just look at the parahippocampal fissure and make an understanding that there is volume loss and it's likely that it's Alzheimer's disease. fMRI is very useful in the, in the days when the PET was not very active. What are we trying to look at the fMRI? This is very simple. An Alzheimer's patient or a minor cognitive neurocognitive impairment patient, if you show him, let's say, a very famous Amitabh Bachchan, let's say, now you show him the photograph of Amitabh Bachchan. He won't recognize it. And uh, he, the, the, whilst if I'm, look, if I'm in the MRI, if I show him Amitabh Bachchan first time, my recognition goes, second time recognition goes, third time recognition goes, fourth time I get bored, my brain starts going into the default mode networks and think about everything else but not Amitabh Bachchan. So the recognition is lost. Whereas in Alzheimer's disease, it is the progressive repetitive inputs make them recall after a longer time. So that's the way uh, task-based networks work, broadly speaking. This can be with the visual, this can be with auditory, it can, it can have different tasks, but the most important thing is repeated stimuli will make a difference in patients with Alzheimer's, whereas a normal individual will get really, really bored and he will stop thinking about it and the default mode network start becoming more prominent. On the other hand, if you use resting state networks, that's a very interesting part. In a normal individual, you have a precuneus which is very active. In a patient with Alzheimer's disease, the precuneus becomes slowly, slowly, slowly uh, reduced in its activity. Because we know that it is a very robust connectivity network where there is posterior cingulate, medial temporal lobes, precuneus, dorsolateral, prefrontal cortex. These are the ones which should get activated. So for example, there is no dorsolateral prefrontal cortex. There is very reduced, significantly reduced uh, precuneus activity. So that you can pick it up. Now DTI, as I said, Alzheimer's disease is not limited to hippocampi, but it is diffuse. Once it is diffuse, you can identify areas which are diffusely involved, which is parahippocampal gyrus, temporal white matter, splenium of the corpus callosum, posterior cingulum, white matter. Practically, a lot of areas of the brain get involved. These, uh, these can be better imaged with Nodi, but a deficient tensor model with a Gaussian kind of model is also okay. 
in an advanced patient, but early patient with minor neurocognitive impairment. That is where we want to identify this. So that is when we can't really pick up uh, with a deficient tensor model. As I said, spectroscopy is good. Both GABA and glutathione were used. Both are reduced in these patients. They are GABAergic uh, abnormality. There are a number of papers, huge number of papers. All these papers have come long since long time. That time when they were using it's only 1.5 Tesla. So the commonest metabolite that they identified was NAA, which is reduced. Again, this is not at the level of the minor cognitive impairment. It is not at the level of the pre-Alzheimer's dementic pathway. It, this is established. That's not what we want. We want to identify it at the time when the patient is likely to go into Alzheimer's. So that is the GABA allergic excitotoxicity. That is quite sensitive. It's much more sensitive probably than a, 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 a uh, nuclear medicine studies like SPECT and PET with FTG, but if you have to go for a real investigation, you would want to go for a better ligand with uh, amyloid and identify it. Multinuclear spectroscopy with sodium has been shown to be quite sensitive. Uh, and so this is of course not easily available but it tallies with the uh, most of the advanced ligands that uh, PET, PET scan uses. But unfortunately, this is not available easily. So we discussed about blood flow. The blood flow in the different regions of the brain uh, is attenuated in Alzheimer's disease. Again, it is not a very good technique to identify uh, use it in a pre-neurocognitive impairment patients. Now, the blood-brain barrier disruption has been shown. This is very, very fascinating. This blood-brain barrier is used with dynamic contrast-enhanced perfusion. This is a marker for capillary permeability. The metric is K-trans. It gets influenced by, very easily by uh, modeling. For example, if you give contrast to the patient, pre-contrast and post-contrast, cortical signal intensities is by 5% and white matter is about 2% pre and post. So the difference in the contrast signal intensities are 5 and 2%. But when you want to look at a microscopic capillary permeability, you are really looking at a very, very low level blood brain barrier disruption. So this needs a proper proper kind of model. Normally, PATLAC is a type of model that we use. It's a two-compartment model, and it's considered to be most robust, and very, very interesting observations are there. Say, for example, in a tumor, if you give contrast and you measure K-trans, is, there is nothing great. You can actually easily show it, and if K-trans is increased, the plasma volume is increased, there is nothing. But in a normal looking individual, when you want to identify it, you have to measure K-trans at a normal brain. So the modeling is extremely important. This is a paper which we published in AIDS where we demonstrated K-trans in uh, ANI and MND in patients with uh, HIV disease. And it was a kind of uh, a seminal paper because nobody else, nobody has identified that there is such a, neuro, such a very early blood-brain barrier disruption. Similarly, minimal hepatic encephalopathy is another area which neurocognitive impairment occurs. They have also blood-brain barrier disruption. What we noticed is in the parietal cortex where there is uh, abnormality in the spectroscopy, there is abnormality in the blood-brain barrier disruption as well. So the similar Procedures of uh, contrast-enhanced MRI with perfusion were used in Alzheimer's disease. The, the group from Maastricht, Netherlands, have used that and demonstrated wherever there is low blood, blood flow, there is reduced or uh, increased capillary permeability. This is considered to be an extremely sensitive marker in the pre-neurocognitive impairment patients. And... Uh, 
obviously has a lot of potential and a lot of people are using it. This is another fascinating area of research. Well, um, the, another group from uh, Southern California, Montana, also did the similar thing, but instead of doing for the whole brain, they looked at only the hippocampus and looked at the hippocampal signal intensities and uh, pre and post with the blood brain barrier and demonstrated actually that the Cardmemos 2 is, uh, is Cardmemos 1 is the most significant area of abnormality in patients with Alzheimer's disease. Now, what is important for us, as we just discussed, uh, that's all about the Alzheimer's. Now, this is where the money is. All of you have MRIs and all of you, whoever is uh, trying to look at these patients with uh, monoclonal antibodies, they have significant abnormalities in the brain. So this is where you have to be very focused and listen to me carefully. So these monoclonal antibodies increase the capillary permeability. Once there is a capillary permeability increase, you get the spectrum of RCVS, for example, a spectrum of um, um, reversible um, press, for example, reversible encephalopathy due to hypertension. Or the entire spectrum of these uh, increased capillary permeability, you would see it. But there are two types in this. These, these are, as you can see here, amyloid related imaging abnormalities area. And these areas are two types. One is a typical increased capillary permeability. Therefore, you'll have sulcal effusion and the sulcal high signal intensity. The other one is micro hemorrhages and frank hemorrhages. So there are classifications. You can go and refer any textbook, standard textbook. There, are a, a, there is encephalopathy and there is uh, hemorrhage. These are how they appear. Um, I work with um, one particular monoclonal antibody. I don't want to pick up the name. And uh, this is what we look for if there is increased permeability. This is not ischemia. This is not diffusion positivity. This can be seen both in the cortex as well as white matter. And these are typical of patient who has started monoclonals. Within three weeks, they start developing headaches. And when we do the MRI, we see them. They are not limited to a particular lobe. They can be seen in the posterior fossa, they can be seen in the temporal lobe, they can be seen in the white matter. That is one type of area. One, another type of amyloid related uh, abnormality is the hemorrhages. These hemorrhages can be one, two, three, or they can have a frank large volume intracerebral bleeds. So this is a problematic thing. Uh, once you identify it, you have to warn that the patient cannot go for the chelating agents and they have to stop it. So this is extremely important. I, I, I have no doubt that the entire India will start seeing them more and more and more and more. And uh, everybody should be aware that there are two types of uh, this amyloid related imaging abnormalities, which we call area, both E and H. One is just an increased capillary permeability, other one is a hemorrhage complications. Now let's go into the Parkinsonian syndromes, which can where MR can make a big difference. The Parkinsonian syndromes are three, we know that. MSA, the primary Parkinson's disease, MSA and PSP. Can we differentiate that? This is how I report in my department. When a patient is re referred to the department to me, what I look for is first thing, if, when the patient is come with a movement disorder, I look at the substantia nigra. In substantia nigra, there is pars compacta and pars reticularis, and you have in the medial margins of the pars compacta, you have the nigrosomes. These nigrosomes are high signal on SWI imaging. This high signal is normally very clearly seen and different birds, names, tails, uh, all that kind of stuff. But it's important to notice this high signal. I don't know how it can be a, a swallow tail. 
I have never seen that swallow bird at all. So swallow tail, if somebody says yes, it is swallow tail, but it is this linear signal intensity in the dark areas. This linear signal intensity completely uh, is lost in patients with primary Parkinson's disease because microsomes are abnormal in these patients. So remember, absence of the normal high signal intensity in the substantia nigra is a very characteristic observation in patients with primary Parkinson's disease. You can, you can bet on it. You can talk to your clinician and tell them that this is primary Parkinson's disease. Recently, Lewy body disease in 2021 neurology, they have demonstrated a Lewy body disease also can have the similar observation. So of course, we know that the Lewy body is very closely linked to the Parkinson's type of disorder. So there is nothing, but it is not MSA. It is not PSP, but it is Parkinson's disease or at the most Lewy body disease. There are only two things. We know that there is what is called crescent sign. This key, they keep talking about this gliosis around the lentiform nucleus, but it is a 1.5 Tesla MRI. We all have now three Ts. You won't see that because in 3T, you have a, a increased relaxation of TE and most of the vendors do not allow the TE to be too long. So you don't really appreciate that little crescent, which you would normally see it on 1.5. That's, but the crescent sign is very well described in Parkinson's disease. Whereas in MSA, you have this, in MSA, we know that there are two types. We have MSA P and MSA C. In the cerebellar type, you have this so-called hot cross bun. What is this hot cross bun due to? That's the question we ask, isn't it? This is the transverse pontian fibers and the Pontane fibers. These are gliotic. And you have the corticospinal tract and you have the, these are dark in nature. So naturally that gives you a gliotic area in the background of darkness gives you that uh, kind of a hard cross point thing. PSP we know is loss of midbrain. And this is one normal midbrain. Whereas here the superior concavity is what gives away the answer. I can show you more dramatic, but it is in the practice, you want to see the superior concavity, which is the most important part. In a normal convex superior surface, and a concave superior surface. So that is how you make a diagnosis. Of course, the ancillary observations are several. You can use the collicular thickness, tectal thickness, and you can also see midbrain, superior, midbrain and pontane ratio. This midbrain and pontane ratio, I thought I have, yes. So this is how we measure the midbrain and pontane ratio. You, you actually take the area of the midbrain, the area of the pons, you take the ratio of this. Similarly, you take the ratio of the middle and the superior cerebellar peduncles, and you give the product of it, will give you the MSA, the PSP, the so-called MR Parkinson's index. This Parkinson's, MR Parkinson's index is more than 17. It is considered to be very specific for PSP. You can also do DTI and demonstrate that there is significant loss of these fibers in the superior cerebellar peduncles, but um, I don't know how many people really take uh, that kind of a trouble to reconstruct them. It's always, remember, these kind of pretty figures are only in the advanced cases. So you have to have normative data to say that in patients with MSA, the diffusion, the tracts of the superior cerebellar peduncle have increased mean diffusivity. That's what we want to say. But, well, it is not always possible. So we want to show the dramatic effects. So that's where the dramatic effect is. So now we skip to the other areas which have abnormalities which are similar to Parkinson's and, uh, and or even Alzheimer's disease. But these are patients who have got deep uh, white matter ischemia. As you all know, I don't know how many of you do use this uh, Fazeka scoring, but it is a confluencing white matter signal intensity in the periventricular regions, which causes, which is what is, Fazeka score is all about. 
there are two types, isn't it? Lipohyalinosis and leukoariosis. Lipohyalinosis is mild and paler. Leukoariosis is transependymal CS of seepage due to white matter integrity loss. Depending on coalescence or non coalescence, the Fazeka score is one to three. So remember, this can previously we used to call them as Binz fungus disease. I don't think you guys are, do ever hear about it. That was prehistoric, but now we use the so called deep white matter ischemia, whether it is Fazekas 1, Fazekas 2, Fazekas 3. So remember that, and it's good to use these words so that clinicians will get impressed with your knowledge. The third area of uh, today discussion is NPH. Previously, when we said NPH, we would want to do CSF loss. And what is NPH? NPH basically is secondary to increased transvenular resistance when the brain actually puts out the noxious substance into the dural sinuses. That is where the NPH pathology rests. What happens in as NPH previously, we, I still do the CSF flow studies. But the thing is now CSF flow is not being very popular. The reason is it is much more complicated. It's not a bad technique, it's a complicated technique. So you use Evans index. If the Evans index is more than 0.3, it is suggestive of NPH. If you use calosal angle, because it's not atrophic, so naturally calosal angle is not very wide. Therefore, if it is less than 90, you would think it is NPH. But what I want to stress today is this particular word, magnetic resonance hydrocephalic index. This is a very fascinating observation, which has supposed to have specificity of 95%. Most of this work I do in my hospital. I have not done this yet. So this is a very important uh, observation which they have made in the movement disorder paper in 2021, a later half, that is November, it has come. So it is, I think, a very interesting area. We have to work on this and see. I'll talk about it. Dilated third ventricle, wider temporal horns than later horns. We know that. Whereas when you, if you do the CSF flow studies, they have said a magic number of 42 microliters as an accurate output. I don't believe so because you have to have normative data again. In my, in my hospital where I did from 50 to 60, 60 to 70 normal patients, at least 50 of them before I started calling a patient as NPH. So this normative data is equipment specific. So you need to have uh, your own normative data before you call 42 microliters as abnormal or normal. Now, what we would call previously NPH, you can see the flow void at the aqueduct. If the flow void is dark like internal carotid arteries, basal artery, that means the flow void is really, really rapid. It is like arteries. And that kind of a flow void means we are talking about NPH. And there is periventricular leukoriosis. You have dilated uh, sylvian cisterns and you have effaced cortical cells on the top. These are the normal anatomical things. This is the MRHI, where you measure the transverse axis of the trigones of the lateral ventricles and the maximum internal diameter right anterior to it. If you have this kind of an MRHI with a number of some 0.95, this is considered to be extremely specific. Please remember that and uh, try to look for it. And uh, we know that at the level of the posterior commissures, if you measure the callosal angle, and that angle will also tell you with a reasonable accuracy that it is NPH but not uh, PSP. That's where the differential diagnosis mostly is. This is the CSL flow. You have the anti-grade and the retrograde flow because there is a yo-yo thing at the aqueduct. And there are two things. One is you can actually look at the regurgitant fraction, which is 98%, or you can look at the absolute stroke volume and you, might, you multiply it with 1,000, of course, and it is 60 microliters and 98.1%. Therefore, it has to be a NPH. So you be very firm with the clinician. If you have all these things, you have a very narrow calosal angle. You have a high Evans index and you have a positive magnetic resonance hydrocephalic index, which is standard. I have not done this yet in my hospital. So 
I'm a bit cautious to give you the number, but the literature tells you that it's anything 0 0.9, 0 0.5 above is considered very specific, but I'm just cautious, that's all. Um, so as far as CSF flow is concerned, I told you, so that's what you would want to look at. Uh, anything in my equipment, on my equipment, it is more than 0.75 is stroke volume is considered to be very specific. And uh, in regurgitant fraction, you don't need to have a number comparison. If it is 98%, it is NPH. Hepatic encephalopathy is another area which we discussed already. And we know that when you have high signal intensity in the globi pallidae, that means you are talking about paramagnetic compound deposition and it is hepatic encephalopathy. But it is a pre-hepatic pre encephalopathy. That's where the uh, uh, challenge lies. You can use myelin water imaging, which is a very another fascinating area. I, I didn't tell you. Myelin water imaging is a very fascinating area. It is a, one of the, going to be one of the most important hot cakes in the research. Uh, dementia is research. I cannot make it more glamorous than this. So I have to tell you the facts. That's why it is a little dumb, dumb, it's a little dull subject, but I have to give you what I have. And in prehepatic encephalopathy, the area of that you can use for the research is myelin water image. And spectroscopy is extremely useful. Myonostol is through the roof in these patients and glutamates and glutamines also go through the roof. So that's a very interesting area. Wernicke's encephalopathy, we know periacrital gray involvement. We know that splenial involvement. So that's where the Wernicke's encephalopathy occurs. And this can be, patients are naturally very confabulatory, naturally irritated, and they won't lie. But it is the periacrital, peri-third ventricular, perichiasmatic, perihypothalamic. These are the areas which you want to look at. Korea is another area which we see it in India. I don't know whether you guys now look at them. It's a caudate lobe, caudate nuclei, which is completely atrophic. So in this case, it's caudate nucleus. And I just want to end this talk with this particular area, which long COVID, that produces neurocognitive impairment. India had a lot of COVID. So now you're going to see a lot of long COVID. It is not a, one of those things which is, uh, I used to think, in fact, cynically, that these patients of long COVID are mentally imbalanced people. It is not true. It really exists. What was the, what was the premise with which I started this? Initially, I started that this is a symptom. This is really an imaginary issue. Patients do not really have any major problems. They have underlying some kind of a... Uh, some kind of an imbalance. But what, uh, what has been described is it's characterized with lethargy, apathy, lack of motivation with neurocognitive changes. Then this paper came. The initial COVID paper from France said that they have identified RNA of the virus in the CSF. That's number one. Then we know that all these viruses are neurotropic, all the COVID viruses are neurotropic, so there is a possibility that they might have really gone into the brain. Why is it that we are not demonstrating? My pathogen, my, my postulation was it's a one-hit theory. COVID has come, hit the brain, disappeared. We have evidence RNA was shown in these patients. This has led to a cascade of inflammatory change that led to the neurocognitive changes. Whether they are permanent or non-permanent, we don't know at this stage. But we think these are not really permanent. The inflammatory cascade slowly subsides. But as long as it is there, they have a definite underlying abnormal. So this is the paper which I'm talking about, Inflammation in Brain 2021. There is cognitive impairment. There are several papers, anybody who's interested. So what we did was we have a up study in our hospital where we have recruited all these patients. And we looked at patients who did not improve 
And what we thought was there is neuroinflammation, there is excitotoxic injury, therefore it is positive on MR spectroscopy, it is positive on DCE derived tetrons. This is the premise. And we have done 18 patients. We have totally about 50 patients, out of which 18 patients had long COVID. And these long COVID, we have read it in ASNR. In fact, our paper had a lot of traction in that. So there is diffuse increase in the permeability of the brain in these patients. There was gross reduction in the glutamates, glutamines. And there is also white matter integrity loss. We have compared it with kinurine pathway. We have used now microglobulin. So we have demonstrated k trans has increased. There is increased um, glutamate. Uh, there is marked reduction in the glutamate glutamines, and there is also marked abnormality in DTI tracts across the entire brain. So the, the so what we tried to say in this is that long COVID is a distinct entity. Neuroinflammation is the underlying event, and the viral injury. What is the source of this injury? My premise is that there was a virus which has gone through the olfactory bulb into the brain, so which showed a localized inflammatory reaction, and that reaction self perpetuated to subside slowly. So in this small, little boring talk, <laughs> uh, what I tried to do was to take you through different areas of neuroinflammation and, uh, and show you what I do in my hospital. Thank you, sir. <laughs> Thank you. It's really glamorous talk, sir. Not <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Interesting points. Uh, actually,